Welcome to the Richie Flow Nutrition Podcast. My name is Cameron Borg. On this episode, I had the pleasure of speaking with Jack Cruz for the second time. Jack is a practicing neurosurgeon with a particular interest and expertise in quantum biology. In our previous podcast episode, Jack and I focused on the pillars that lay the foundation for all life on Earth, light, water, and magnetism. In this conversation, we delve a little bit deeper into the esoteric ideas and discoveries that help make sense of how life can thrive in such diverse conditions. We touch on olfaction's role in mate selection, biophotons, magnetic fields in reactive oxygen mechanisms, the microbiome, and much, much more. With all this being said, I really hope you enjoy the episode. Jack, thank you so much for giving me some more of your time. Um, Last time we spoke, I learnt uh, so, so much. I had to listen to our conversation a bunch of times. And um, that's led me to understanding a little bit more about what I actually really want to talk to you about now. Um, So, yeah, thank you for giving me some more of your time. No problem. So I wanted to start by asking uh, about mate selection and olfaction. So... A couple of years ago, there was a paper published suggesting um, that uh, repeated miscarriages were related to olfactory perception, particularly of male odor in the brain. And I've been thinking for several years now that the use of deodorants and perfumes and just generally not being able to smell one another's uh, actual scent is really impacting the way that we interact with others, particularly those we see as potential mates. Um, I wanted you, I wanted to ask you your thoughts on this and how important olfaction is in the way that we uh, interact with one another. Well, let's make it um, a pretty simple story for people to understand. Say you go out to a club or a bar and you're out there, there's three guys in the bar and there's 100 women. And we turn all the lights out and we make you wear earmuffs. Okay, so you can't talk to anybody. Would it make sense to you when your sensory perception is blocked that you're going to be able to talk to women so that you could find out if you have a connection with them, if A, you can't see them, and B, you can't hear them? So the interesting thing that you bring up, because you talked about one of our senses, which is olfaction, which actually happens to be the oldest one from an evolutionary perspective. We're talking about this is part of uh, the paleocortex, meaning if you were to look at the mammalian brain, you're going all the way back uh, to the uh, origin of mammals, 280 to 300 million years ago. This was the original cortex. The original cortex is three layers of neurons. Uh, In us, meaning humans, we have six layers of cortex in most places in our brain. But it turns out, right, where the olfactory cortex is, there's only three. And it's the oldest part of our brain. And one of the other interesting things about this old part of our brain, this should also ring some bells for you, is between all of our senses, the five senses, actually, I'm going to tell you it's six because mitochondria is another one. We have melanin present there. Most people don't know that there's olfactory melanosomes that do that. So the way uh, sex selection or mate selection really works, you're designed to smell someone else's immune system. Okay. So if you use perfumes, if you use deodorants, if you use any odifference at all, then you begin to realize that it creates an interesting problem. And the way the three-layer cortex works is not undifferent than the six-layer cortex in humans, but it turns out that biophotons and ROS and RNS are really, really important in three-layer cortex, actually much more important than it is in six, because six layers has three more layers of processing. And when you're dealing with three-layer cortex, uh, it turns out the ROS signal is really important because that's actually what creates the biophoton release in cells. So effectively, what you're doing in three-layer cortex is you are really sampling someone else's electromagnetic footprint to see if they're compatible, uh, not only with your biology. It's not so much a mitochondrial story. It's actually really a story 
uh, is do, do our immune system really work? And this story goes back so far, especially in humans, most people don't know that the genes that actually form the MHC complex uh, and formed, you know, the genes that actually formed our brain called sonic hedgehog that controls migration, uh, they all lead back to these immune-mediated problems, meaning that your immune system allows you to pick the right person because what is the goal of you know, evolution or nature. It's to make sure that the offspring is viable. Back in the early days of, of, you know, mammals, there was no issues. There was no electromagnetic pollution to get involved. So this was not really an issue. So it turned out that the ROS signal versus the biophotons was much more important. And the ROS signal, this should make sense to you because T and B cells use uh, like superoxide, hydrogen peroxide, and the Fenton reaction uh, to create a massive amplification of the system. So when you're able to smell someone that actually is additive to your immunity, that actually is going to drive a lot of your biologic selection. So your uh, presupposition that when we get involved in masking our sense, is there an issue? The answer is yes. Uh, and this is a, is probably some of the oldest uh, quantum biology that's in us. Um, if you remember the last time we talked, um, when we talked about the Uberman podcast that we did, Uberman uh, got really big into talking about the guy who won the Nobel Prize for olfaction. And I told him I was not really a big fan of that cat. I was a much bigger fan of uh, uh, Luca Turin because I think Turin's mechanism um, in terms of how we really work with olfaction is much more accurate. And it turns out you've asked a question that uncovers why I believe that, why I don't believe the guy that won the centralized uh, prize. It's because the difference between six layer and three layer cortex means that there had to be another important part of the story to drive it. And it turns out that there is a switch in mammals that controls biophotons and actually controls ROS. And what people don't realize until you actually break it down for them, they all, everybody knows that light is called an electromagnetic wave. What they don't realize is that light has an electric field and it has a magnetic field. And it turns out with the immune system, the electric field, which is mostly the photon part of this, uh, is not as important as the ROS part. And the ROS part is the magnetic part. It controls the magnetic chemistry that's present. And your immune cells in the MHC histocompatibility um, complex pay humongous attention to superoxide pulse, pay huge attention to uh, hydrogen peroxide, and pay huge attention to the Fenton reaction. And it turns out these T cells, when they get activated, we have massive amplifications of ROS to actually fuel how the T and the B cells actually work in natural immunity. And one of the first things that was really important, like especially when you layer this on with um, Nick Lane's work, you begin to understand this is why dogs and cats smell each other's butts. Uh, you actually see remnants of this in us. I, I would tell you it's the reason we kiss and it's the reason why we perform oral sex. For the exact same reason, you are actually getting feedback on this. And I've actually told some of my members, you know, if you enjoy kissing and you enjoy oral sex, it actually tells you something about the person that you're with. If you do not, it also tells you something. Uh, because remember, we are the mammal that has the two frontal lobes that most other mammals don't have. So we can override this paleocortex, this three-layer cortex, with making decisions say, look, I think it would be wiser for me to stay with this person even though they don't smell great to me because from an evolutionary standpoint, you know, it may be better for me to hang out with a guy who's rich and old and has a ton of Bitcoin um, who doesn't smell as well. And that doesn't, that's not operational in mammals that are lower on the evolutionary tree. Why? Because they didn't have frontal lobes to actually help them discern that there's other parts 
to the evolutionary story that may be more important for survival today than it was back in the beginning. So I'm going to tell you, this story goes back 300 million years when mammals, you know, first came on the planet. And if you understand evolutionary history, that puts you even before the last extinction event, you know, which was 65 million years ago. So this is a, this, this is a pretty old story. Uh, I don't think it's one that's well appreciated by, you know, centralized medicine. Do I actually think old fashioned is one of the things in the next probably 50 years that we're going to find out is truly electromagnetic. Absolutely. And I think the more electromagnetic pollution, I think the more uh, modern beliefs, you know, around smells, as you said, deodorants, the use of aluminum oxide, things like that. These things are all really, really not good. And do I think they play a role? It's not the dominant role in why we have a divorce rate of 50%, but do I think um, that people would be really surprised that sex at its fundamental level, as well as mate selection, is an electromagnetic phenomenon? Very interesting question to start a podcast with. Well, that's why I chose it. I've been thinking about that for a really long time because I'm I'm a very uh, scent centered uh, person. Um, it, uh, it's a it's a scent that really matters to me, particularly with um, the people that I'm around. And um, I don't know if you know, but um, in excess, the lead singer Michael Hutchins uh, lost his sense of smell, and uh, he went crazy oh. after that because he couldn't smell the scent of a woman. And I always really understood that when I found out about it because of how important scent is to me in that regard. Um, it also, remember, it also played a huge role in COVID diagnosis because that was yes. one of the first things that people lost. And the other thing that's very interesting is that this plays a role in taste because when your sense of smell is bad, your sense of taste is bad. So it actually brings up another important part. Is there a, a hierarchy to the senses? I believe there actually is. And I believe the hierarchy is different in different mammals. So for example, I don't think you and I talked about this last time, but I think when I did Abel James's podcast um, uh, in April, when I talked about all the crazy connections, uh, I made the comment that um, dogs and, and whales and, and other mammals like dolphins have put a lot of energy into the hearing mechanism because they use echolocation. Same thing with bats. And people don't realize that that is uh, an important part of that story. Like, so those are mammals that use that sense differently than we do. I think, you know, dogs and cats, you know, cause I'm trying to keep this common sense um, that they use the sense of smell much more so than we do. I think the sense of smell for humans has been one of the senses that's been dulled the most um, because of, you know, our modern abilities. The interesting thing is uh, this sense organ sits right underneath our frontal lobe. So it's almost as if the brain is grown around this part of the oldest part of our brain. And um, I've always wondered, um, in us, because one of the things that sits right on top of uh, sensation is our orbital frontal gyri, which really controls a lot of the limbic system, which is tied to emotions and stuff. And I think this is the reason why certain people, like, as you mentioned, scent can really lead to a lot of mental illness. Why? Because a lot of the mental illness is tied to disruptions in the frontal lobe. And it turns out a lot of the reward tracks sit right above the olfactory groove, you know, in the brain. So the story about NXS I did know about because I used to be a big fan of theirs. Um, and I did know about his uh, mental illness. But the interesting thing is I always assumed that his problem was related to, you know, him being in the industry that he was in because I do believe that the blue light, the RF, the microwaves and stuff at night actually probably played a bigger role than his sense of smell, but it would not surprise me if the sense of smell predated that. And I also think it's very interesting that potentially the sense of smell went bad before the six layer cortex, because the stuff that we're talking about, the frontal lobes right above it, that's six layer. 
stuff in olfaction is three layer. Uh, it would not surprise me if we figured out that three layer cortex was more easily damaged than six layer cortex. And the reason I say that is because remember, when you have six layers, that means you have more myelin. More myelin means more protection. So if you only have three layers, you don't have as much myelin. So therefore, it's much more at risk from an electromagnetic perspective. So that is another interesting, you know, thing to think about, you know, with this uh, situation. But I do think there's a difference in different mammalian species. In um, almost all of the biophoton research you read, it's very well emphasized that there's no way we can see the biophotons that are coming off the body. And it sounds like what you're saying is that we do actually perceive the uh, photon signal. Well, I disagree with that. Yeah, I actually right. disagree with that in a big way. I I'm going to tell you that um, the use of Kerlin photography, the GDV camera, kind of puts a, a wet noodle into that whole thing. I think... It's pretty fair to say we know for vision, you know, we see basically probably 380, I would say up to maybe 7, 760. I think in the near infrared range, we are definitely blinded, but that's because the near infrared range does some special quantum magic. I think 380 is the big cutoff because I also think there's some quantum magic going there. And, and if you know anything about the uncertainty principle, if you can actually see it, observe it, it changes the effect. And I think that's the reason why we're blinded to those things. But I think, say, between 400 and 700, oh, I think we can see it. In fact, it's part of the reason why I think when people go out to have coffee with each other uh, versus kind of like what you and me are doing right now, um, I think the effect when you're around somebody, uh, you're much more impacted in real life than you are when you talk to somebody over Skype over Zoom, you know, over social media. And I also think that's the reason why the behavior on social media many times is really bad because you're not getting proper feedback. It's kind of like the argument that you made earlier, Jack, by wearing, you know, Chanel number no. five, are we really fucking ourselves in terms of who we pick? The answer is we are, but we're actually doing the same thing, probably with senses that we're much more attuned to using than the one you're talking about, because the one you're talking about uh, goes all the way back to the original story. And I don't know how many people know this, but um, the genes in humans that control immunity and brain growth actually come from the same place. So this is a big deal. Uh, when you have a problem with sense of smell, uh, it kind of tells you that you may have a problem with uh, neural migration and neuroectoderm. It clearly... Uh, it always raises my eyebrow. It's one of the things I check in TBI patients uh, because it's almost one of the first senses that is always injured in a TBI case. So something you brought up last time, which I'm embarrassed I was ill-prepared and uh, not knowledgeable enough about, was non-equilibrium thermodynamics and dissipative structures. Um, since then, I've, I've uh, been very, very interested in how biology um, necessarily exists in the phase transition between order and chaos. That's that's what we call complexity, basically. And this idea, to me, sits perfectly well with Gilbert Ling's association induction hypothesis and what, what is probably the true role of ATP, which is a role more of balance rather than just making as much as possible to generate energy. It's not about that. It's about creating the right environment within the mitochondria, within the cell, um, to balance uh, this this dissipation, uh, which allows the... Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm going to tell you, Cameron, I don't know if I let... I'm going to argue with you a little bit about the word balance. I think the word balance has no role in biology. Interesting. In fact, okay. I think it's a very centralized idea because it brings back the idea of equilibrium. And if you really understand quantum thermodynamics like especially like Arenas's fourth law of thermodynamics that's never talked about, you know, with the other three, this is where pure regime becomes a big deal. Life is meant to be lived out of balance. Mm -hmm. And that's the real, that's the real come to Jesus moment that you have to have. Yeah. And you realize what Ling really said, the most amazing thing that Ling said about balance was, was the only time that the cell is truly at equilibrium is when we're in rigor mortis. Yeah. That actually opens your eyes up to 
Ling really understood something about biology that the centralized people around him did not. Uh, but I don't think quantum thermodynamics, the, the science of pyrogene and Ling actually are completely yoked. Uh, I really don't. I think uh, it gets really interesting. I think Ling was so focused in on knowing that he was right and Peter Mitchell was wrong. Yeah. I almost hate to say what I'm going to say, but I really feel this. I feel that Ling never asked the next question. It's actually the same way I feel about Einstein. The reason that quantum mechanics and relativity are not unified is because of the fights that he would have with Bohr, you know, about uh, the disconnection and why things were never unified. I actually think um, the answer is actually tied to this switch that you talked about earlier. This is a switch I very I have not talked about with anybody on a podcast, but I did introduce it recently on my blog to my members. The switch is 270, uh, I'm sorry, 1270 nanometer light in the near infrared range. That's where ATP production and ROS production are balanced. When you go past that, you actually create um, more ROS. So let me try to give you the idea that I tried to share with you earlier so you get this fully. You have an electric and magnetic field. What I'm saying to you is biology, the electric field is the photon. That's the photoelectric effect. That's all the basic stuff that most people will understand. Magnetochemistry is all about ROS. Remember, all ROS, RNS, unpaired electrons, you see it on EPR, you know, microscope, it, those are all magnetic chemicals. What people don't realize is the magnetic chemicals, for example, when you're a high latitude guy and you live at a high latitude, how does the body replace light that's no longer present in the environment? The ROS signal does it. And when you get past the 1270 nanometer light, guess what the signal is? See, the problem we have in centralized science is we kind of believe that ROS is either good or bad, there's no indifference. And like anything, uh, especially when you understand quantum thermodynamics, it turns out that there's always a reason behind how things work. And it turns out the light that we make inside is really important to the ROS story. And it turns out the balance in the red spectrum, specifically from 600 to 3100, which is the spectrum that's present in our sun, um, the key metric is right around 1270. That's when ATP production is balanced in red light, be, you know, before and after it. When you go too far, you get more ORS. When you go below it, you're, you're actually going to generate more biophotons. Why is that important? It acts like an equalizer switch to the cell inside because what are you doing? You're effectively changing the spectra of what a cell can emit. And... Cells have to have a way to handle uh, the electric and magnetic fields. And if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense that cells would be based like this because I always tell people that nature is decentralized. A lot of times I don't think they understand the nuance, but the simple nuance is light and dark. Light and dark controls the circadian mechanism. What am I saying to you clearly? Within the spectrum of light, there also is another hierarchy that people don't realize it's between the electric and magnetic field and magnetochemistry controls timing biophotons controls energy and why is this a big deal for the question you really asked me because when you think about the difference between newton and einstein the di main difference is time relativity why is this time thing such a big deal and everybody keeps tripping over it in Newton's world, time was always absolute. You know, there, it was never considered relative. So what does that mean? In a Newtonian world, cause and effect is real. And most people who listen to this podcast to this very day believe that cause and effect is real. I'm going to tell you in 1905 and with Heisenberg, both of these guys proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that time is not. There's no evidence of cause and effect. It's just an illusion of what we believe because of how we experience nature. But time relativity tells us that it is an illusion. And the irony 
uh, here is that even inside of cells, how they control different things, um, quantum thermodynamics has told us that time controls the flow of energy over matter. This is a radically different idea than what Newton had for 500 years. And that was the major innovation, I think, of Einstein's world, that when he showed that not only is everything relative, but time is relative, then you begin to understand how ROS really works. So I'll, I'll try to make this as simple as I can, because I know this is complex. You know that when you look at the TCA cycle, you make 147 ATP from fat. You also know when you use glycolysis, you're making about you know 36 to 40, depending on what happens. The third option that nobody talks about is the pentose phosphate pathway, which can make variable amount. What's the, the linkage that I'm trying for you to understand? The amount of light that comes in turns on each one of those pathways. So what am I saying to you? That light controls time relativity. Okay, so let's take this to the next level. I just told you that within light, there's both an electric signal and a magnetic signal. The magnetic signal is used more for timing. The electric signal is used more for the chromophores. That would be like the neuropsin system, cholesterol, uh, you know, catalase, uh, 328 nanometer light for vitamin A. But that's actually not how the magnetic signals work. What are the magnetic signals in the body we're talking about? Superoxide pulse at cytochrome one. We're talking about uh, hydrogen peroxide uh, creation at cytochrome two. We're talking about uh, the Fenton reaction, um, you know, that can happen when calcium flows are changed. What chemicals control that? The unpaired free electrons. Why did why did nature build this story, Cameron, the way that it is? Let me ask you a question, and this is a question I want an answer from you. Was oxygen present on the surface of Earth? for 4.7 billion years, or better question is, when life first innovated, the two domains that we're here, that we know were here before us, archaea and bacteria, was oxygen the dominant gas in, in, the, in the atmosphere? No. The answer is no. No. Right, but, but was light here? So it turns out, guess what happened? What's the real story with ROS? When actually oxygen shows up, and you go read Nick Lane's book, we began to be able to use magnetochemistry and magnetochemistry adds another layer to the circadian mechanism, okay? That's really important. So what am I telling you? That within seasons, there's a different magnetic chemistry footprint mm. that's present in us. So now maybe you begin to understand why Jack Cruz is such a stickler about different foods eaten out of seasons yeah, yeah. and why that's the case. Because guess what? The ROS pulse is radically different. You know, say when you're eating something where you are in Australia now and I'm here, you know, in Destin, Florida, we can eat the same food, but the signal that is being created in us is radically different. Not only is it radically different at the ROS level, but guess where the real big difference is? On the biophoton level. It means the light that we create inside is radically different. And then you say to yourself, okay, how does this affect all the non-visual chromophores mm. you know, that Jack has been throwing out on, on you know, the Patreon blog for three or four years? You, you begin to see truly how complex the story is. And that's why when you mentioned Gilbert Ling and you used the word balance, you saw how I almost recoiled from it. I want you to understand why I recoiled from it mm -hmm. because the level of understanding that I have is uh, I'm going to tell you multiple layers deeper than Gilbert Ling had at the height of his career. Why? Not because Gilbert Ling was a dumb guy, because the science was not so well-developed in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s as it is now. We know way more now about the non-visual photoreceptors. You know, back in Ling's time, he didn't know anything about melanopsin. He didn't know anything about this. The only thing that he knew is that when ATP is made, it unfolds the side chains of proteins. He's absolutely correct about that. But it turns out when you unfold the side chains of proteins and you think about his AI induction hypothesis, he was only really studying the electric field side of the effect. He didn't know anything about the magnetochemistry. 
And it turns out this magnetochemistry is how time controls the fuels in our body, which is part of the reason why I have a huge problem with guys like Ray Pete. Why? Because Ray Pete used to think many great things about Ling, but Ray Pete didn't have this level of sophistication that I'm explaining to you. And, you know, he was a PhD in biochemistry, but he never stopped and asked the question I'm asking you right now. Why is it that we have a variable ATP out output for beta oxidation glycolysis in the PPP? That should actually get you to start thinking about cells are able to use time relativity to de determine the energy flow. How do they do that if they're just using only one part of light? And then you begin to realize within a photon, there's more information in there than you thought. So, Pragesh, that was a circuitous way of answering your question, but hopefully you understand uh, why I said what I said. I, I know, I, I definitely understand it, and I realize now why balance is not the best word when you're talking about something that's inherently imbalanced on purpose. Um, and Pragesh exactly. really stressed the importance of dissipation in order to maintain dynamic adaptation or the ability to, um, you know, self-organize and, and remain complex. How do you humans... remember what he said in his Nobel Prize speech? Do you remember what he said? About time irreversibility. But he also said the most important thing about understanding dissipative states is timing really matters. Yeah. And that is the point that I've been trying to get everybody to realize for 20 years. This Circadian timing is one part of the timing mm. mechanism. That timing mechanism is more about the electric fields. That's the light and dark story. The 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 I guess the curtain that we just pulled back on the wizard now, this is a totally different uh system. This is actually how the Warburg shift really happens in us. It actually is a story of the ROS signal along with the biophotons. That's really how it happens. And when you really parse into it, you begin to understand, like the guys who are the food girls out there that think, think that, you know, glucose and insulin are linked to cancer. That's totally not true. Right. It turns out that, believe it or not, blood glucose actually quenches the ROS signal. It turns out when you really get into it, people that have type 2 diabetes and type 1 diabetes, they don't make any superoxide pulse at all. So what does that tell you? tells you the ROS signal in them is completely gone. So then you got to ask yourself, what, what is creating this ROS signal in us? And this brings us right to Roland Van Wick's book. You know, when you make biophotons and you make ROS, what do you need? You need oxygen and you need ROS to make light. That's actually what is said in that book. It's what was said by all the Russians in their literature. It was said by the Japanese in their literature. The funny part of the story, when you read all of Roland Van Wick's book, they still don't know where the light comes from. But guess what? People who are reading my Patreon actually are beginning to understand where it comes from. And it's tied very much to this story that you're bringing up. Um, to understand how we make order from chaos, you need to understand the dissipative state. You need to understand the nonlinear effects in light. You need to understand that ROS is the magnetic flux fingerprint of the photon. And here's the crazy part. You cannot make ROS the way we understand it without oxygen. And what did we have first? What's the oldest ROS in the system that actually olfaction really works with? RNS. It's nitrogen because nitrogen's always been here. Mm. And guess what? That is a rudimentary system in us because now that oxygen has gone up to 21% of the atmosphere, um, new, more complex mammals are using ROS signaling and this also begins to explain, well, why is it that younger, and when I say younger, I mean older evolutionary mammals don't do the same thing as humans do. So what am I trying to be provocative about? Why is it that we don't make vitamin C, but guinea pigs do? Might it have something to do with how olfaction 
and the free radical signal works. I'm going to tell you it does. Most people, most people know when they've read Jim Al Khalili's book. They know about the European Robins, and he talks about magneto reception. He talks about cryptochromes. He talks about all that. But you know what he never told you in the book? He never told you that the radical pair mechanism has only been found to work in the lab. It doesn't work in cells. You know what the interesting part is? The radical triad mechanism, when you have three radicals, that means three chemicals with unpaired electrons that are magnetic. Well, guess what? Those chemicals are in us. The ROS signal, the radical that's made from flavins, which is cytochrome 2. What's the last one? The ascorbic radical from vitamin C. So you begin to realize every time there's a stress response in a neuron, do you know what the neuron releases? Releases water and what else? Vitamin C. Really? I mean, like that. Yeah, you can't make you can't make melanin out of dopamine without vitamin C can't make norepinephrine, which also is part of the melanin tree when it breaks down without vitamin C. You can't make epinephrine without vitamin C. So the funny thing is, when you open up the biochemistry book that Ling and, and, and Ray Pete, you know, studied at them, they don't have an answer for this conundrum. And what am I trying to tell you? I always try to be provocative with people and say, look, go and read see what's in the biochemistry book, and then come back to me because I'm going to tell you there's layers of this onion that these people have never thought about touching. And the reason they haven't thought about touching it, you have actually are scraping some of the icicles off the window now by asking me about Pierogene's dissipative theory. Most people don't even know that he won a damn Nobel Prize for this. They don't even realize how important it is. Um, and they don't realize that you, you look, all metabolic networks happen spontaneously. Nick Lane has come to this idea literally in the last probably 10, 15 years. Because, you know, he was a big believer in biochemistry. But what did he say? He basically said that um, we have electric membranes to create biomolecules uh, using our membranes uh, from gases. And Basically, metabolism all happens spontaneously. What the genes do, the genes influence the metabolic pathways. Then what influences the genes? It's actually exactly what you and I are talking about here. It's a timing mechanism. Actually, ROS and uh, circadian mechanism actually links to how energy flows in a system. For example, how does a kidney work different than a brain tissue? You know that those organs in us it gets back to the original question you asked me, Jack, how does olfaction work, you know, with three-layer cortex versus six-layer cortex? You have to realize there's a program in us, like another quirky thing that you may not know, you know that the retina works on a Warburg metabolism. Well, if that's true, Tom McSupfried tells everybody that, you know, the Warburg metabolism is a sine qua non of cancer. That's fucking ridiculous. Mm. And, you know, of course, when I say it in a podcast, I'm the douchebag you know, for calling this guy out because why? He's way ahead of the centralized doctors. He is, but he's still fucking wrong. So of course I'm going to tell it because the normal metabolism in the retina is a Warburg metabolism. You got to ask yourself, why is that the case? You know why it's the case? Because you need the ROS signal. See, that's the magnetic part of the story that people have missed. And when you begin to understand how life functionally organizes both around the electric part and the magnetic part and why timing such a big deal, then you begin to realize the reason why nature has done this is because certain tissues run better uh, with beta oxidation. Other tissues run better with uh, glycolysis. And um, the main reason the retina does what it does and works on a Warburg metabolism because it's always being photooxidized by light. So guess what? It has to control growth in the eye. Like, what's the worst thing that could happen in the eye for you to get, you know, a tumor to grow in the retina? Then you're losing the signal between the environment and the brain. Because remember, everything in the brain has to work through the eye and the skin. Um, and that tells you that high, pro high proliferation tissues always want to use a Warburg metabolism. Well, guess what? I just told you something very, very interesting 
about pure gene system. In other words, instead of you thinking that it's pathologic, realize it's about timing. That's really what it's about. Uh, and, you know, I actually just came back from Bitcoin Prague. I was actually giving a talk about this timing mechanism. And I said to people there, obviously didn't get into this topic, but I told them that Bitcoin uses the same idea that's used in cells. You know, Bitcoin uses Newtonian time. It does, it's not measured in in hours or, or seconds. It's We do 10-minute blocks. And the reason why that works is because you have to create an immutable ledger in the digital world. That means you need cause and effect. So what did Satoshi Nakamoto effectively do? It He used Newtonian time to create cause and effect because you need that for accounting purposes to solve the double spend problem. Well, what do cells do? Because remember, I told people, Bitcoin is a time machine. So is mitochondria. Turns out mitochondria work on relativity. It works with Einstein's special and general relativity. Doesn't work on Newtonian physics. So if you go and listen to the Abel James podcast that I just did. He asked me a really provocative question tied to all the things that you and I are talking about. He said, do you think Elon Musk is really wise uh, to put a chip in someone's head for Neuralink and do you this, that? And my immediate answer to him was, no, I don't think it's a good idea. And then I, I stopped and I threw something out at him that uh, is tied directly to what you and I are talking about. Uh, and I was going to save it to talk about it on Uberman's podcast, but it's clear I'm not going back on Uberman's podcast because of all the shit that's happened since. But I told him, think about the animals that made it through the last extinction event that were not mammals. They were theropod dinosaurs that were birds. Do you know that they that nature put a chip in their retina? What's the effect that you know is Cameron Borg of that effect? This is the reason why birds have unbelievable sight. Why? Because in that chip, all of their melanin and their blood vessels are on that chip. It's called pectin, P-E-C-T-I-N, okay? And it's in front of their retina. So the rest of the retina has no blood vessels in it, which means they have incredible eyesight that they use for prey. But what's the other big effect that you get when you put a chip in front of your main semiconductor circuit? It allows you to have anti-gravitational effects. It also allows you to be able to fly long periods of flight without eating. Why? Because you can make blood glucose from light. Think about that for a minute. Because what do birds do? They disconnect from the environment, right? They disconnect from the earth, fly long distances without eating. I mean, the one that I, the animal that I talked about the most in my book, the Epipaleo RX was the Arctic tern. I said, don't you find it amazing that the Arctic tern has been present you know, on Earth since the last extinction event? And to this very day, for 65 million years, after it was a dinosaur, it flies from the North to the South Pole without any breaks, 10,000 miles without eating. And it does it because of this chip in front of its eye. I said, if you don't think that this is super duper engineering, of the leptin milano and pathway, then you really don't understand some of the high-level biology stuff that you're beginning to uncover now and realize when that bird flies, it's flying via longitude. It's not flying via, via um, uh, latitude so much. It, it does, but the thing that it's paying attention to as it flies is the magnetic flux. And we know from... Uh, the Klitschko's work and the stuff that, you know, Jim L. Khalili brought to the table, that this stuff's really important. But I don't think people realize how incredibly important it is, even for us as mammals who are really designed to work on the earth. You know, you think about our nearest relatives, you know, they were in trees. They They had a bigger connection, I think, with the grounding effect, with magnetochemistry and with electrochemistry with us because we've built a world where we can get an airplane and fly to Australia. We somehow think that just because we can do it, there's no biologic toll for it. Mm. It turns out there is. That's the reason why you get jet lag. It's the reason why you feel like shit when you make a flight like that. The interesting thing is the Arctic turn, its performance 
is spectacular. Why? Because it's put its most important chip in front of its retina and it's not encumbering its sight. You know, and think about the first question you asked me. So Jack, tell me about, you know, smell and how this all works. This is the reason I told you there's a hierarchy in life about how we use things and the type of uh, biology that we use. There are certain people, like for example, people who have tightly coupled haplotypes, they do much better by eating carbohydrates closer to the equator. Hopefully you're beginning to understand now why they can live glycolysis. Then it turns out people that have uncoupled haplotypes that further away, these people do much better with beta oxidation. But it turns out for beta oxidation to work, you have to see the sunrise. Otherwise, it's not effective. And then you begin to go, when you really begin to parse this out, you begin to see how the dissipative structure works at different latitudes and longitudes, but also within species. And you begin to see why certain species have different adaptations than others because of actually how they live their life. And you begin to realize the story with melanin. Not only have I told people in the Patreon blogs and on the Uberman podcast, and actually you, that does melanin absorb all aspects of the electromagnetic spectrum? Guess, guess what else it does? It absorbs all magnetochemical um, inputs. So in other words, ROS can be mitigated by melanin. So this should really open your eyes. You're, basically what you're saying is that melanin, especially endogenous melanin, acts as a buffer, a capacitor. Um, it allows you to make light inside in ways that you never thought about. And, you know, all of a sudden the ideas that I introduced to the world last year, they're not as crazy as you thought. Like you'll read the papers about, you know, proteins that are made from mitochondrial metabolism, like melanogenin, that actually tan your insides. When you lose that tan, the most common disease people know about is Parkinson's. They don't realize though, Alzheimer's is the same thing. It's just a different part of your brain, multiple sclerosis different part of the brain. Uh, when you begin to see things like this, that's where you sit down and go, Pyrogene and Arenas were really, really, really smart because they were telling us timing controls where the flow of energy and matter is. That is the key to understanding quantum, quantum thermodynamics. That's the part that Ling didn't get. That's the part that Pete never got. That's the part that the food gurus never got because they never took it to the physics level that they need to take it. It turns out timing is more important than anything else in life because time is actually how energy flows. And these are the base ideas that are in Einstein's relativity. These ideas are absolutely devoid in the Newtonian world. But remember, it doesn't mean that they're not useful. We use Newtonian physics to get to the moon. But the problem is Newtonian physics couldn't explain the perihelion of Mercury. Well, Einstein could. And it turns out that mammals happen to be um, an animal on this pro uh, uh, planet that actually needs to use time relativity to really understand how food and light work in us. And to truly understand where I'm headed and where none of your other interviewees are headed. This topic, this is the topic that I am most fascinated by. Timing and quantum thermodynamics, Pyrogene's ideas, Arenas' ideas, the fourth law of thermodynamics, that timing controls the flow of energy and matter. Bro, this is, this is what it's all about. This is what we need people to focus in on, um, then I think we can move the needle for like chronic diseases today that we, we're we impotent to do anything with in centralized medicine. So I wanna pitch something to you. You can tell me what you think of it. So I've been thinking a lot about gradients, how people have been able to adapt in all these different environments all over the world. So we have temperature gradients, we have 
photon both energy and density gradients. We have magnetic field strength gradients. We have deuterium hydrogen ratio gradients. We have macronutrient distribution gradients, and we have light dark cycles that are all based on um, various uh, various fluctuations throughout the year, depending on where you are. So it seems to me what you're saying is that when all of these are yoked together, giving sort of triangulating together, telling your body all of the right sense information, all of the right environmental information, the timing mechanism is perfectly yoked together, and the body is able to effectively use and control the flow of energy. Is that is that sort of where you're going with this? I'm going to say you're very, very close to being accurate. The only thing I would tell you is time determines how those things are yoked or not yoked. Right. In other words, it's it's the king of the hill. And this is what's been buried in my leptin prescription forever and ever and ever. Uh, I, I always tell people, go back and read the original leptin blogs, then go back and read like cold thermogenesis four and six. One thing that you'll be shocked at when I talk about the ancient pathway I always told you that the key was found in the eye and the key was about endothelial and nitric oxide synthetase. What is nitric oxide? It's an unpaired free radical signal in the eye that works in a very short zip code. It doesn't have global effects. It's really local. Guess what? The, the eye, the skin, the blood vessels, that's all magnetochemistry. Mm. It's all about ROS. None of that system is old from an evolutionary standpoint. Why? Because oxygen... I mean, you know when the great oxygenation effect was. You've read Nick Lane's book. That's not the way it was when bacteria and archaea were on the planet. What were they basically? They were using light and dark. They were using electric fields. They were not using magnetic flux. Now we're using magnetic flux. So when you realize you added another system to your equalizer, then you have to realize, okay, what organizes all of these little nuances? you realize it's time. And as counterintuitive as that sounds to you, the only way you come to this idea is actually through the physics. Like this is the reason why I think Peter Atia, Uberman, and all the other food gurus, you know, trip over their dick all the time because they don't understand time. They don't understand, you know, some of the things like Henry Bergson and Pyrogene. Like I, I always thought it was amazing when I read a lot of Pyrogene's work and Arenas's work, they would always talk about, Henry Bergson's work, you know, who's a philosopher, not even a scientist, but what did he cut his teeth on? On time. They realized that time was a huge factor. And when you go back and listen to Pierre Regine's Nobel Prize talk, he mentions time so many different times. People don't understand time stamping is the single biggest story in decentralized medicine, in decentralized biology. And I can't stress to you enough until you go down this rabbit hole, you will always be confounded by what's in your biochemistry book. It will make no sense to you whatsoever, you know, why it is that, you know, beta oxidation makes so much more ATP than glycolysis until you understand uh, what nature is fundamentally doing. Um, you need to limit ATP production at certain times. So that brings us back to what brought us down this rabbit hole, the use of the word balance. Mm -hmm. you, you get to understand why I kind of stopped you and said, now I understand why Jack hates that word because it's not balanced. This is just like an equalizer where we're tuning the knobs and it turns out the single biggest effect of tuning those knobs to get it right is actually how time is, is tracked for in cells. So I'll give you another example, not to blow your mind, but remember who um, discovered oxygen, Lavoisier. And back in the 18th century, when he was getting into fights with a whole bunch of people in chemistry, one of the most interesting stories is, you remember we used to have barber surgeons at that time. They would leave England to go down to the tropics, like down to uh, Australia, because you know there's a big connection between the monarchy and Australia. You basically guys are a commonwealth of, uh, of England. But one of the most important things that happened at that time, barber surgeons were all in these boats. So they would leave from London or Southampton at the 51st, 52nd latitude. They would traverse just like the Arctic turn does, come to the equator. And the barber surgeons would be uh, nervous because when they cut the sailors to bleed them, 
They always thought they were hitting arteries when they got closer to the equator. And it turns out it wasn't. They were actually hitting uh, the same veins that they did at the 51st and 52nd latitude. Lavoisier at the same time was discovering oxygen. And what people did not realize is that you have more venous O2 in your blood when you are at an equatorial position than not. And the barber surgeons actually were teaching Lavoisier something about oxygen. And this story that I'm trying to bring to you is actually the story of magnetoreception. It's the story of magnetochemistry. It is, it is the biggest untold story. And it's funny because Tesla once said that when you, humans figure out how to uh, capture magnetic flux from the sun, everything is going to change. Well, guess what? The greatest story never told, which we're talking about now, is actually how ROS is that signal, how we do it. And oxygen is critical in that story. Um, you know, most people, the next thing I'm going to say is probably going to really shock people. Uh, most people think that, that uh, oxygen itself on the periodic table is a very reactive uh, chemical. No, it's not. And the reason why it's not, 21% of it's in the atmosphere. How come, you know, the atmosphere is not burning up and this and that? Turns out it's not. The most reactive chemical with the, has the highest electronegativity neg on the periodic table is actually fluoride and fluorine. But it turns out those six electrons that are in oxygen made life more magnetic. And one of the things that I like to point out to people, where I first pointed this story out, and of course it never made any traction, was in 2014 when I was invited to the Bulletproof Conference with Dave Asprey. And he famously threw me out of the event because I basically told him that all the guys that were selling all the shit inside were all full of shit. I basically told people at that time, do you know that oxygen is the only paramagnetic gas on the periodic table? I said, do you know what the implications of this are? And of course, nobody really got it, but I basically told them. The reason why oxygen is a great terminal electron acceptor is because it's drawn to magnetic fields. Well, what's magnetic? We learned from Michael Faraday in the 1850s, when you put electrons into something that spins, you basically make an induction engine, right? Well, why do you think nature did this? This this whole design about oxygen showing up, those, those are the original 1.0 parts of quantum biology. What's happened after that? This ROS system, the antioxidant system that works with it, you know, all the stuff that Dave was trying to sell people about, you know, glutathione and, and, and methylene blue, these things actually mute the ROS system. If you don't know what the ROS system is doing, do you understand how the use of methylene blue or, say, UV blood irradiation or hyperbaric oxygen, you know, you, you name it. I think you're beginning to understand where I'm going with this. You're fucking up the timing. So what are you doing? You're changing how you use metabolism. And when you change how you do metabolism, this could be how you get a pterygium in your eye because everybody wants to blame it on the UV light. And it turns out that's not the case at all. Is because you don't have enough of a Warburg metabolism being used in your eye. So you get increased proliferation on the surface of your eye and you go, oh, fuck, what would do that the most? All you got to do is put sunglasses over your eye. It changes the magnetic chemistry. Well, guess what? Who put that in their book? Fucking John Ott. He said people that got pterygiums always used a lot of things on front of their eye. Well, you don't realize when you put anything in front of your eye, what are you effectively doing? You're changing the magnetochemistry of that tissue. The ROS and RNS signal is radically different. Um, and I think so many people have read my work uh, have never asked the questions that you just asked me. You asked me the key question about pure genes um, dissipative state. Gilbert Ling was a smart guy, but he never went far enough. Uh, Ray Pete, I mean, I, I, people will get mad when I say this on your podcast, but he's a smooth brainer. He's he's like, you know, biochemistry 1.0. But you and I are talking about on this podcast, bro, we're playing 4D chess compared to those guys. And, and don't think that I don't hold, you know, Ling 
with some reverence. Why? Because his work, you know, got us the MRI machine. If it wasn't for his work, you know, people would still have been flummoxed by, you know, Peter Mitchell and his chemoosmotic theory. And we all know that chemoosmotic theory plays a role in the ATP story, but the ATP story really is the base story about how energy production works in, how shall we say, non-complex mammals. Like the stuff that we use that's at six layer cortex in the brain, bro, we, we got to use way more complicated stuff than that. And it turns out the retina, which is an older tissue, kind of like olfaction is, it uses a Warburg metabolism all the time. Why? Because it's it acts to stop proliferation. The reason why the Warburg metabolism shows up in cancer, because the cell is trying to limit the growth. It's actually not a pathologic thing. It's actually reactive to the circadian timing mechanism that's totally fucked up, which is why maybe now you're beginning to understand why I have a problem with Thomas Siegfried and his idea. Because no, a Warburg metabolism is not sine qua non of cancer. It's actually a sign that the cell is trying to fix its timing problem because the dissipative state is broken. It's a time problem, not a fuel problem, not a food problem. Um, eating carbohydrates when you have cancer is not a problem. It's a problem because it ruins the timing mechanism that's based in Arenas's fourth law, that's based in Pyrogene's system. And to understand my perspective, you have to come down my rabbit hole. And when you do, bro, everything changes. Like you begin to realize, wow, everybody is operating at, uh, at the wrong level. And the only way to change the world, as far as I'm concerned, is that you have to keep showing people the literature keeps proving me right over and over again. Like, how did I make all these predictions and be right? It's because I have an understanding about how things really work. And I know that eventually guys like Nick Lane will come to the idea that, yeah, the TCA cycle only spins clockwise when you see sunrise. As crazy as that sound, you know, 20 years ago when I said it, it's now been proven true. You know, then it's incumbent upon you as the kid doing a podcast me, I really need to parse out and understand what Jack's really saying. Because then when you do, you start to go, wow, this is, this is a pretty radical concept because you begin to realize when you have it wrong and you don't understand it, uh, you believe the things that Ray Pete did, that eating carrot salad makes a difference or that, you know, drinking, you know, orange juice all day is a good idea for your hair. No, it, it's not that carbohydrates are bad. It's just that you're focused on the wrong area. If you don't understand that light controls the electric field and the magnetic field, which is buried in the food story, then you, you don't realize why, you know, all the different metabolic pathways have different levels of ATP in it. It also means there's different magnetic signals in it. it means that tissues are so fine tuned that your kidney can do something different than your retina at the same time in the same environment. That's what makes our, our biology amazing. So Pragagene really emphasized the importance of dissipation. And there are a few researchers out there who are sort of focusing on this idea about how the body dissipates energy in order to maintain complexity. But their focus is primarily on um, uncoupling of um, the mitochondrial respiratory chain as a way to dissipate. I suspect biophoton release is also a way of dissipating quantized amounts of energy. Um, is Absolutely. That's what ha- melanin is about too. Right. Remember, that's what melanin's doing. Melanin and water in a cell. Let's take the simple stuff. What is water effectively doing? It's taking all the heat out of biochemistry and burying it in water. And then it doesn't affect the reaction times, okay? Think about all, all chemistry. All chemistry is based on timing. Well, isn't that what the ROS signal is really all about? Actually, let's make it even simpler. Think about enzyme, enzyme kinetics. Isn't that about timing? If you don't believe me, take a piece of uh, liver and put it in hydrogen peroxide and tell me how that works out for you. It's it's the fastest enzyme in the body. You know, it works, you know, 2 million times faster than your biochemistry book says it should work. 
but we don't seem to have an idea why. It turns out it's this ROS story that controls it. Um, and when you see it unabashed for the first time, I will tell you that you cannot go asleep again. It's really, really difficult. And with a guy like me, you know, you can see me smiling here because, you know, I'm peeling the onion skin back for you and letting you see the way I see the way a cell works. And you'll see that it's radically different than most other people. Why? Not only have I thought about this longer than other people, but I've read things that destroyed my perception of the things I learned in medical school and residency that I was taught. Remember, I was taught everything Peter Atia and Huberman, Ray Pete, uh, even Pierre Jean were taught. But I realized none of those things truly explain what life can still do. That meant there was other layers to the onion that it was my duty to go down and find. And Pierre Jean, his work um, wasn't greatly applied to biology, but I can tell you that I applied it to biology. Uh, and that dissipative state, the guy that clo got closest to it, in my view, was Gilbert Ling. Gilbert Ling really, really, the, the stuff that made his book so difficult to read, he was trying to use the English language to describe quantum processes, which is crazy. But that's effectively what he tried to do. And it's really hard to do that. And that's the reason why when you talk to you know, quantum biologists or you talk to quantum physicists, the language that they use is mathematics. They don't use the English language. Why? Because it's just not effective to explain, uh, you know, for example, how the, the Lorimer uh, frequency works or, you know, how the Zeeman effect works with hydrogen uh, protons. This is all, you know, mathematic. But it turns out these things are extremely important to you. They're really important when, when you begin to understand how ROS is calculated. And uh, like, for example, the Zeeman effect in quantum mechanics is probably the single mis most misunderstood thing uh, in Jim L. Khalili's work. Um, the radical pair mechanism is operational in certain parts of biology, but Probably the best explanation that I can see for what the European Robin's able to do is actually a, a radical te tetrad a pair. I think it's three radicals that do it. And the thing that the reason why it makes sense to me is because we make so many different radicals as eukaryotes in us. And I generally tell people this story. The most common particle made in the sun is a neutrino. If you think that a neutrino doesn't have a role in biology, then you're not, you're not in the same program I am. I'm I'm looking for that role and what a neutrino really does. The same reason I'm bringing this to your attention now. Um, if you don't think that free radicals play a massive role in magnetochemistry, bro, you and I are not in the same playground playing the same game. So one thing that's become very obvious to me is that the way that the current science scientific establishment is set up is um, sort of in not enabling ideas that sort of don't fit in it to, co to come in. And one of them uh, that I became aware of after speaking to you last time was the experiments by Garyev and Poponin's, their DNA phantom effect. And it just seems like what they found was just, there's no way to integrate that into the way that science is practiced today. So um, this is a very interesting experiment um, and I've never heard anyone talk about it, probably because... Uh, like I said, no one's had any way of integrating it. So can you sort of let me know a little bit more about what they did? And I guess the real question I want to ask from this is what is the true role of DNA? Um, I think that's probably the best way to start this discussion. Um, DNA is an electromagnetic device. It stores both light and magnetic energy in it. So I want you to think about a magnetic tape in a computer. This is an old kind of computer now, not like the new ones we have. Most people remember the old tapes that we used to have had magnetic heads on it. That's very similar to what happens in um, DNA. Like when you look at the DNA code, you see all the base pairs and you go, how does biology figure out in a gene like where all these introns and extrons and everything are? 
it's all all done via magnetic magnetic chemistry. It turns out the ROS is able to turn it on, which brings you to Barbara McClintock's science of jumping genes. When she proposed that, everybody thought she was crazy, and it turned out, guess what? She won a Nobel Prize for the same thing because she showed that the organization that's present in DNA completely is above our understanding in centralized healthcare. And it gets even further. This is one of the things I really like talking about. I just talked about it today when I did another podcast about Bitcoin. Um, When you remember Craig Ventner, it's probably uh, outside of your age group, but in the mid nineties, when he was working on the human genome project, you know, everybody assumed that humans would come out with about 100,000 genes compared to gorillas and chimps would have about 23,000. And when we found out that we have maybe 100 to 200 genes more than them, and you look at a picture of a chimp and a gorilla and us, and you see there's very little genetic differences, immediately, what should have been the response of um, centralized science? that everything that we believe from Darwin or neo-Darwinists like Dawkins is completely fucking wrong because there's nothing about our genome that actually tells you what makes you human from chimp at all. In fact, uh, it gets even crazier when you think that an octopus, you know, which is the old, one of the oldest uh, animals on this planet that Huberman studies actually has a bigger genome than humans. Go figure that out. An animal that's 600 million years old has more DNA in it than we do. And they have a pretty simple body plan. But the interesting thing is they do have the human brain 1.0 in their heads, which makes them kind of unique. So they liberate their light and they spit out their melanin as a defense system. And what do we do? We retain our light and retain our melanin but we have a, a brain that is capable of huge quantum computing, you know, on a wet, warm surface. So what am I going to tell you what DNA really is? It's an electromagnetic capacitor of information. That's what it is. And it's stored both electrically, photonically, and magnetically. And the things that it does, the way in which it works uh, is completely attuned to the environment that it's in. In fact, I'm going to tell you the mammalian body plan, in fact, the body plan of every organism on this planet is more tied to magnetochemistry than it is to electrochemistry. And if you don't believe me, you can look at the, the story, two guys I'll give you, the story of cymatics, which is you can take grains of sand on a a symbol and play music and you'll see different types of forms that show up. The guy that did it in water is uh, uh, the Japanese guy, Emoto. And he showed that the hydrogen bonding network is able to change. We see it even in tears that there's, when you're sad, you have a different hydrogen bonding network present in, in water of tears than you do when you're Uh, happy or sad. Well, guess what stores all that information that you get from the tissues that are, or I shouldn't say tissues, but the components that are in your cell. That's what DNA's job is to do. And DNA, the way I like to think about it, it's the library of Alexandria of the Rosetta Stone that is Mother Nature. And how it works is completely quantum mechanical. It is the original quantum computer. Um, It's highly, highly organized, uh, but most of its magic actually is based in the question you originally asked me. Um, It creates order from absolute disorder. It doesn't need, it doesn't need any, you know, being up in the sky It's able to organize information electromagnetically um, in ways that we still can't fathom. And when you talk about, you know, the research, you know, that uncovers some of the things, you know, about like the DNA phantom effect, you are actually seeing a shadow cast 
of the innate abilities that's present in this molecule. There's nothing in us, I think, that's more complex than how DNA works. Uh, but do you see hints of it? Like, for example, DNA cannot work unless it's hydrated. Why? Because it turns out you need those protons to be moving on the phosphate backbone because that actually turns it on and turns it off. It's almost like, you know, when you used to watch, uh, I guess, the Star Wars, uh, not Star Wars, but the Star Trek show that was on TV, that when you pulled out, you know, a tape deck out of the thing and nothing worked in the transporter, that's exactly kind of what DNA is. And it turns out, you know, people make a big difference about like methylation and, and histones and acetylation. All that is that those are clues to how the magnetochemistry and the electrochemistry actually are going to translate different parts of the genome and, and what's going to happen here and there. Like, for example, to try to make this um, consistent with, you know, current events, think about what we're dealing with COVID. Why is this such a big deal that people now are getting cancers that have had multiple jabs? Cause a frame shift mutation, which on the surface doesn't seem like a big deal, you know, having one or two or three frame shifts um, in DNA, but yet that can turn into a retinoblastoma or it can turn into somebody who had breast cancer 15 years ago and now they have, you know, grade four malignancies literally after their second jab. And you go to yourself, how is this possible? Because exactly what you said earlier in the podcast, there is nothing in the molecular genetics books or the biochemistry books that explain this effect. And the reason why is because they're all quantum mechanical. I found it interesting that in bacterial colonies, if they're exposed to uh, high energy photons, the bacteria on the outside of the colony will actually excrete their DNA to protect. And I always found that interesting that DNA absorbs UV light. Called, called Sorry. the auger effect. Yes. Called the auger effect. Yes, I was, I was looking DNA, into that because I know you commented on it uh, last time yeah, we spoke. DNA, DNA does that. Let's let's make it even simpler. Do you know who else uses that effect? Penguins in, in Antarctica. Do you know that the penguins on the outside of the colony, when, when it's the coldest of the year, they protect the people on the inside. And what do they do? They migrate inside and then they change. Yeah. And guess what's happening there? Different ROS, different signals that actually helps the colony and what are they doing because their bodies are so close they're picking up the signals of exactly what's going on so the, the the penguins on the outside are signaling to the penguins on the inside and then what are they doing then they're flipping different things around the the penguins that are on the inside then eventually migrate to the outside the same thing is happening in dna and you know, I've told people, I wrote a, a blog a really long time ago called the, I think it's the EMF2 blog. It's called Viral Marketing. Probably one of the things I'm most proud that I've ever written. Uh, and I told people, when you realize that the human genome is made out of basically one uh, retrovirus called HERV uh, V, I mean, most of our genome is loaded with this thing. And you go, why in the hell would nature make us out of viral elements. And it turns out that's really the purpose of virus. That's why when you, I see people on social media saying, oh, viruses don't mean anything. They're fake. You know, we've, they, they break coach, uh, Coke's postulates. I'm like, these are the people I don't even want to talk to because they don't realize that the majority of, of complex DNA is made out of viral parts. And it turns out those viral parts, they signal a specific time, space-time continuum in the Earth's past that allowed for a specific adaptation to occur. That is magnetically and electrically stored in that virus. DNA collects that, organizes it in its card catalog, and it's put in a certain order that's used in a cell. And the, the most remarkable thing is when you look at how the system is organized. I can tell you right now, I think the, the people that will eventually figure this out, truly how it works, are not going to be quantum biologists. I think they're gonna be information guys, like people from the lineage of Alan Turing and, and Claude Shannon, because it turns out when you understand about messaging, 
the single most important thing that Shannon taught us about messaging is that the inf- the message has to be unusual for it to be com- uh, to be you know useful, and that's how I look at at uh, DNA as well. I think the most important stuff isn't like the surface stuff that you know you hear the functional medicine doctors talk about about methylation patterns, you know, SNPs and SAPs and all that. Do I think that's important? Yeah, it's important. But what is it important for? We know that the two astronauts that went up in space, one stayed on the ground and one that went up there, big difference was in their methylation patterns. That tells us that the EMF in space highly methylates the the genome. Well, what does that tell you? It just tells you that there's a different magnetic footprint. It also tells you that DNA can work on other planets. See, this ties into some of the things that Elon Musk has talked about. Is it possible that we may be able to adapt to different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum on different planets? My belief is DNA allows for that possibility. But I can tell you, on Earth, the way our genome is constructed, no, it has to work this way because for DNA to travel like it usually does on a comet before it hits another world, then it has to adapt not only to the native star, that star has a different light spectrum, it also has a different magnetic footprint. Um, and then what happens? That DNA then able to figure out how to optimize to its new star, to its new planet, to its new Schumann resonance, to say its new aurora belt, to um, the magnetic and electric hysteresis that's present. All the variables that you talked about before that link to how energy flows and timing, everything has to be recapitulated. But do I believe that the DNA chemical itself has that innate ability everywhere it's found anywhere in the universe? The answer is yes. It's that moldable. It is the ultimate um shapeshifter it's an electric magnetic shapeshifter that has all the ideas of quantum thermodynamics buried into it every single thing that we'll ever find in quantum physics is buried in the chemistry of dna Michael Levin at Tufts University um, seems to be sort of carrying the torch of Becker, or at least that's what it's what it seems at the moment. Um, and his work really emphasizes the importance of um, gap junctions, electric fields, and um, all tied into that ion channels. And I was wondering because I know there is there was a little bit of debate regarding uh, with with Ling talking about I think it was the sodium uh, the sodium pump. Um, all these all these ion pumps in in the cell membrane, and I'm wondering what's your view on on Mike's work and how much emphasis is placed on um, the movement of ions uh, in and out um, of of membranes, controlling that electric field. I think I think this is an interesting topic. Why? Because again, Ling was the first person that brought the idea that atomic molecular organization is the key to what's going on in the cell. I think what Levin has done is taken it to the next level. Um, But do I think that the mechanisms that he's working with, they're still very rudimentary, just like they were when Becker was around. Yeah. Um, I think what we're going to find out is that the things that cells are able to use, they use some of the weakest electromagnetic fields to control some of the most important things in cells and how they're all coordinated is, is via time, which gets back to, you know, the thing that we talked about like an hour ago. Uh, And I think if they're not tightly coordinated, what do you get? You get chaos. It's just so different than when you listen to music. Um, I think all of these things are important, but I think ultimately how they all speak together is based on AMO physics, meaning where the atoms are are really important. And that links directly to molecular resonance of actually how things talk to each other. So that's the tuning fork effect. So do I believe that the ion channels that Levin is talking about act like tuning forks inside the cell that allowed the cell 
to either harmonize with the Schumann or get to a second, third, or fourth harmonic, does the second, third, or fourth harmonic actually control different things in biochemistry? Does it change the signaling in DNA? Or, or is this what I'm trying to picture I'm trying to paint for you? It's like a giant equalizer that actually is able to make music. The problem is the environment has to provide some quiet time when it changes. The quiet time on Earth, the basic is that there's circadian ultradian rhythms. Those are the ones that work on Earth. And that's the reason why certain of those processes have been magnified in cells and also in DNA. The same thing would not be true on Pluto or Jupiter or Mars or, say, in Andromeda, um, because that footprint is radically different. And what DNA has to do is it has to reorganize in that chaos to create order from it. But ultimately, what controls it all, uh, my belief right now, is AMO physics, molecular resonance, and quantum mechanical principles. That's, if you were to ask me, that's the game that Levin is really studying. That's the game that Becker studied. Uh, do I believe that we have the tools in laboratories right now to study how these effects are working, like to really pin down truly what uh, DNA is capable of or what a cell is capable of? No, I don't believe that we have that technology yet. And do I believe that leading edge will continue as we go on? Yeah, I mean, just think about it. Right now, physics, condensed matter physicists are really working with silicon, germanium, you know, transition metals, but they just started screwing around with graphene. Graphene is a topologic insulator that's carbon. But remember, every single semiconductor that they've screwed around with um, is not carbon-based, right? So how much physics do we, how much physics do we really not, don't know about? I would actually tell you it's just like the electromagnetic spectrum. We on Earth only operate in one octave or 1% of the electromagnetic spectrum. I believe the same thing is true with the physics that we've uncovered. We, we've only uncovered uh, the physics that our instruments and our technology have allowed us to uncover. If you think that that's all that's running cells uh, is what we've discovered to 2024, I'm gonna tell you, um, my observation of science is different. It's kind of like I gave you a clue before, so the sun makes neutrinos more than makes anything else. Have you ever heard anybody mention neutrinos in biology in the same sentence? That kind of tells you that, guess what? If you think that nature's not taking advantage of a neutrino in some way, it just means that we haven't figured out the mechanism yet because we don't know the physics that's behind it. Um, we can't even you know, make relativity and quantum mechanics talk to each other uh, so I think we're very rudimentary in terms of our understanding of the science that truly controls life. The one thing I'm very certain in saying that I think Becker and Levin are on the right track. Why? Because they're on the physics track. Yeah. Whereas guys like Huberman and Atia and, you know, all the food gurus, they keep focusing on the metabolic pathway. And I think, Hopefully, when people listen to the second podcast you and I have done, they are now beginning to see truly how I see things and why I see things the way I do and why I vehemently disagree with some of the people that I make fun of, you know, in other podcasts, uh, because I don't think they truly have a top-down approach. And I think the guy that was the most serious about this in biology was probably Ling, but I think he he had a huge assist from guys like Schrodinger. When Schrodinger wrote his book in 44 that said, what is life? Bro, he's the first one that came up with the idea of negative entropy. Mm. And, you know, back then, negative entropy was, you know, something that makes your head spin. What do you know about entropy? To, to bring it back to our podcast, because I like to make these links uh, for your audience. Entropy is uh, randomness, how you go from chaos to order. What is a molecular clock? In fact, what is any clock? They're flow meters for entropy. 
Think about what I just said about Pierre Jean. Aren't we back to the story about how time controls the flow of energy and matter? Yeah. So it turns out the atomic molecular organization of matter actually has a very particular way in which it flows. Let's cycle that idea now to DNA. You know what DNA looks like because you've seen it in books. You've seen the X-ray crystallography of Rosalind Franklin. You've seen what Watson and Crick have said. We now know that optogenetics can change how DNA works. In other words, when you shine different lights on DNA, it does different shit. And guess what? Same thing is true when we put it in a different magnetosphere. It reacts differently. But the thing is, we don't understand all the variables yet but we know that it's an electromagnetic antenna. We know that it's hydrated. It can't work without water. And we know that the type of water that's around DNA changes the function of what DNA does. So if you don't think that when sunlight comes out and changes the electro perma electrical permittivity, that, that's basically called the coherence, where uh, the dielectric constant in water goes from 78 to 160. If you don't think that every single change there means that DNA has a different capability, then you don't understand life. Because that's exactly what's going on. When it goes from 78 to 88, this part of life is possible. When it goes from 88 to 108, this becomes possible. I think in all of those changes, you will find every single animal on this planet operates in different octaves of what is possible. Um, and I believe that all of life on Earth, the DNA that's in us, since we're the last of life that's evolved uh, in terms of being complex, everything that was present in archaea and bacteria 3.8 billion years ago is present in us right now. In other words, the, the life that they experienced then is magnetically and electrically stored in us. In other words, Mother Nature doesn't let any opportunity to learn go by the wayside. And that's what makes life really amazing because no matter what she faces, she's trying to shuffle that deck and figure out what she needs to do to survive. That's actually the story that's in Jurassic Park. It's the story that's in quantum biology. It's the story in every extinction event. Every extinction event always has the seed of creation in it. It's even the story that's in our, our, our holy books, you know, whether it be the great flood or, you know, the story of uh, uh, Adam and Eve, you know, however you want to look at it. There is a modicum of truth to all the parables that are there of how this story links there, you know, and I always like to take people back to my favorite one, which is in the beginning of Genesis, you know, cause that affects a lot of religions. Let there be light. Yeah. Okay. God told you it's, it's a big story about light, but you know what he didn't tell you? He didn't tell you the recipe. That's what we're here to figure out. That's what Levin's doing. That's what Becker did. I'm putting my two cents in Montagnier's put his two cents in we're all, you're putting your two cents in by doing a podcast like this, Pyrogene the same way. And what are we trying to do? We're trying to parse the onion so that we have a greater understanding. And we don't make the mistakes that people have made, like the mistakes that I hear, oh yeah, well, everybody who has a cancer uses a Warburg metabolism and a Warburg metabolism is bad. No, it's not. And, and anybody who says that axiomatically, I'm always going to have a problem with. I'm going to fight with them tooth and nail because it becomes clear to me that they are a smooth brainer. They have a surface understanding. The problem is we need to go deeper. We need humans out there to listen to a podcast like this because you know, I'm not going to be around you know, a lot longer, maybe 20, 25 years. Somebody's going to listen to this who's 16, 18, 19, 20 years old and say, fuck, that's a great idea. I'm going to study this. That's exactly what happened with Becker when he was in medical school. He listened to Albert St. George's talk, you know, in uh, in 1941, and when St. George came out with the idea, said, look, I think everything around a protein is a semiconductor. If you take a look at the electronic structure, that's what it looks like to me. You know, and he just said it in passing. And what did Becker do? 20 years later, he proves it's true axiomatically. 
Well, think about where we are now. I'm telling you now, the most amazing um, topologic insulator is melanin. It's actually the thing that's made the biggest difference in the mammalian tree. But you've just taken it to a new level. You said, Jack, well, let's, let's talk about the ultimate topologic insulator. Let's talk about DNA. DNA is even more complex than melanin because I think the entire category of life is stored in that molecule. There is nothing that's ever existed anywhere in the universe that's not in that molecule. So in Levin's work, there is this, I probably shouldn't use the word insistence, but it seems like that to me that in order for cancerous growth to take place, essentially all of the communication, the gap junctions between it and the surrounding cells have to be severed. And it's not. It doesn't doesn't rely on on genetic mutations at all. If you sever these gap junctions with a perfectly normal genome, you still get malignant growth, and that's because the cell essentially doesn't realize that it's in a in a group of cells. It, it goes back to this amoeba like state where the, what it focuses on is taxis, so moving around and proliferation, which is essentially what cancer is. Oh, it's self organized. It self organizes itself exactly. to, for survival. So it's it's doing exactly what it thinks it should do. Correct. Exactly right. Because guess what it's doing? It's reading the environment. But you need to realize the environment is what actually changes the gap junctions. Yeah. I mean, I, I try to tell people this all the time. Just, you know, these analogies, I think, are really good for people to understand the basic physiology that he's working out. Think about Barry Marshall and think about the primate story. You know, everybody... When I was in medical school, we used to do vagotomies on people for people who had, you know, ulcers. And we used to think this was a good idea to go in and cut their vagus nerve. Then Barry Marshall comes along and says, okay, I think it's helicobacter. I'm going to prove it. And he looked for an animal model to use. He couldn't use monkeys or gorillas. Why? Because the closest relatives to us have a different gut organization than we have. Okay. So what did he have to do to prove it? He had to drink the fucking helicobacter himself and then scope himself while he did this. I mean, people don't even know that's how he figured this out. He proved it by swallowing the helicobacter himself and putting a scope down his throat while he's awake to look at it to say, this is the proof that this happens. He couldn't use a chimp or a, a gorilla to do this because they don't have the same gap junctions in their gut. That we do. Turns out humans have a leaky gut by design. Why? Because we're designed to absorb tons of viruses that are in seawater. That's what's the difference between us and chimps. And it turns out that those viral elements that we got from seawater played a massive role in encephalization of our brain. That's the reason why we have two frontal lobes and gorillas and chimps don't. It's also the reason why when a human baby is born, it's fat as shit has an immature brain when a chimp and a gorilla have a, almost a fully formed brain and they look like an anorexic, uh, you know, individual because they don't need the fat to develop the brain. You know, and that brings then a new point. Is that the reason why people are getting fat in different parts of the world today? Is there something that's causing a cognitive de-evolution? You know, and, and is the body reacting like the cancer cell is going back to a primitive form. We call that atavism. I'm going to tell you that to me is the key to autism. That's exactly what's happening there. The same thing that's happening in Levin's lab that he's learning about cancer, where there's changes in gap junctions, is the same thing that happens with neural migration. Cells, just as I told you, DNA has a history of all life. So do cells. Pay attention to what cells do. Remember what Becker found, Cameron. He found that in salamanders, in mammals, that red blood cells have the capability to de-differentiate into pluripotential stem cells by using weak electromagnetic signals. Then the hard stop again. Think about what Gerwich found in the onion root experiment, that you cannot pass through mitosis unless you have extreme low-frequency UV light. You're learning some of the key metrics. These are like the beacons, the signposts. So I would tell you the link to biophotons, the link to aura signal is tied 
to the presence or loss of the gap junctions. That brings directly the idea of AMO physics to the cell. And it turns out, this is the reason why, in cancer cells also, size and shape changes also completely correlate to thermodynamics. Um, it also makes sense why mitochondria look the way they do in different diseases than other. But people are not putting those things together. Remember, there's, there's micropores on the inner and outer mitochondrial membrane that are acting just the way the cells in Levin's lab are working. But remember, the mitochondria itself is a bacteria. It's not a eukarya. So you have to begin to realize that how that mitochondria operates within a eukaryotic cell is not going to look the same as a eukaryotic cell that Levin is working you know, with cancer. The key thing is, um, I think what he's focused in on is the morphogenetics. He's, he's kind of... I think he's between Becker and probably Rupert Sheldrake, if you want to know the truth. I couldn't agree I think more. that's where he is. Yeah, I think that's where he is. And I think he's looking for things that are going to get him to the next level. I think one of the things that I find amazing about biology is that I think our brain is pretty amazing. That we can do, when you look at Einstein's papers that he wrote, the most amazing thing in science that I've ever seen, those four miracle papers have no footprints in them. Like when he figured out the photoelectric effect by looking at, you know, Helmholtz's study and said, look, these are the thermodynamic givens. This has to be the answer. And then it turned out that that answer fit directly into the Bohr model of the atom. You just go, fuck, this is crazy. I think the same thing is possible. In biology, I think the thing that's going to get Levin to the next level when we get young minds studying decentralized medicine and decentralized healthcare, they're going to look at the thermodynamic givens that Levin found in his lab, and then somebody's going to go, "This is possibly how it works." And as counterintuitive as that's going to sound to the paradigm, that's why it's going to happen. That's why I don't have any respect for anybody that tells me Occam's razor works. It's total bullshit. There's there's nothing parsimonious about how the photoelectric effect works. But remember, that's just the story about the electric field and light. I just told you in this podcast, you know, we, we got magnetochemistry to worry about too. And it turns out, don't think that magnetochemistry and electrochemistry don't have a cross-pollination, kind of like um, you, know, you brought up with your first question about how does three-layer cortex in the first cranial nerve help in mate selection. And, you know, the, on the surface, most people that listen to this podcast will go, how the fuck do you even come up with a question like that? And then Jack says to you, yeah, this is plausible. And, and there's an answer. This is not an answer that, that classical medicine, centralized medicine, is going to be able to have even a, a conversation about because they're going to say that it's crazy and quackery, but it's not. And it's because our understanding of science is so rudimentary right now. And the thing that I like to tell people, if nature does it and you can observe it, you have a duty to explain the mystery, the enigma, the paradox. That's what curiosity is all about in scientific discovery. Um, so I don't remove anything off the table. I think... Um, some of the stuff that Levin's doing is really, really important. I just hope that he's virally infecting the students that are working in his lab so that they take his work to the next level. Similar to, you know, what Ray Demadian did to Ling's work to create, you know, the MRI machine. Um, I think that's really how science is designed to work. It's, you know, created from other people's ideas, and then we build upon them. Uh, but I think the single most important thing in good science is actually being open-minded, curious, and being decentralized. I think the more you are taught to be centralized, the worse scientist you are. And unfortunately, I think most guys that run a lab like Levin does will tell you that you really have to be centralized because you have to control the experiments. And then I would say, if he goes back and really looks at what Becker was really doing, 
um, it was completely decentralized. And how Becker got tied into this was also completely decentralized. It was from the enigmas, you know, from other scientists. And to me, that's the most interesting part of science. Like I still, to this day, I'm still amazed that uh, Einstein was able to write those four papers and didn't have any footnotes. I mean, you know, if, if you or I published a paper right now in any biology journal and didn't have a footnote in it, it would get rejected by the editors who create the Oracle problem in medicine. Just think about that in a minute. We're actually telling biology students right now that if you have really good ideas and you come up with a thought experiment in your head, no, we don't want it fucking published in a journal. How psychotic is that when we already have four spectacular examples of great science done in 1905 where that happened in physics? Tell me. You know, maybe you think that that idea is crazy. I don't know. I think I think it's a reasonable thing to talk about. And I think, you know, what Levin's doing is good. But I think it needs to go further. Yeah. Um, I've been talking to Kenneth Nielsen, who's a, a geological microbiologist, and he's been discovering that microbes actually require an, uh, an electric environment in order to grow. And he can grow different cultures of uh, bacteria just by changing the, the voltage, just, you know, a couple of millivolts, and you get a completely different um, bacterial culture. And I emailed him and I said... Doesn't that make sense to you? This electricity predates chemistry. Think yes. about it. And I, I remember I emailed him. I said, I is this happen I bet this is happening in the gut, which is why, you know, so many so. people, so many people out there who have gut problems, they only resolve when they do the things that you're talking about when they get out in the sun, which is why, you know, the food stuff doesn't really work because they're not addressing the gut at the electrical level. And to me, right. You know, I have firsthand experience with this. My issues only went away when I started to get out in the sun and I got my circadian rhythm as dialed in as possible. And, you know, you're wondering how does that work and, and why does UV light modulate the microbiome? How does that even work? And I think it's all happening through um, bioelectricity. So um, what is I the think it, I think it actually it happens through control of the cell cycle. Remember, what is the cell cycle all about? It's about timing. Again, we're back to pyrogenes. Theorem. Why? Why does biology always use ultra weak UV light? Because that's what controls mitosis. Mm. Think about all the other parts of the cell cycle. Like we all know, we all learn this in biology. There's not a person in biology that doesn't learn about the cell cycle. But you know what? The one part of it they don't learn, they don't learn about Gerwich's onion root experiment. Like you ain't getting through mitosis without it. So what does that mean? That means if you don't have UV light stored at the electronic level of a cell, you can't proceed on. In other words, what does that also mean? Let's go back to Levin's argument. It also means if you have no UV light stored at the electronic level, that's probably the best way to get cancer. Mm. That's the way to lose your gap junctions. In other words, what do we know about UV light? You and I, that scales to the question you just brought to the table. Do we make more or less electricity from UV light based on its frequency? More, I would A guess. lot more. Oh, yeah. There's your answer. See, that's what I'm saying. The thing about physics that's amazing for biology, when you actually see it and you see the organization, you go, Jesus, this makes total sense why UV light controls mitosis. Because you need to have a tremendous amount of electricity in the cell to control its destiny. If you don't, what is the cell saying? Uh, we're not going to divide. And when the cell is devoid of UV potential, what is the cell? It becomes an amoeba. It becomes like it used to be 3.8 billion years ago, and it does shit. You know, that leaven will tell you, like, these cells are reacting like cancer cells. That's exactly what's happening. And it turns out who whose ideas are tied to um, controlling energy at the electronic or vibrational level in a cell, pyrazine and arenas. We're, we're, look, it's a giant circle, a big loop that we just made in this podcast. When you see it for yourself, and then I always like putting Nick Lane's new slides up that he's given at the Royal Society 
when he basically says, you know, electric membranes are able to take um, inorganic gases from the environment and turn it into biomolecules. Hard stop. Isn't that exactly what Cam and Borg just said about electricity? Because that's exactly what's happening in your gut. It's exactly what's happening in every cell everywhere on earth. That there has to be a system to store this electronic energy. Now, I'm going to tell you the most impressive storage capacity in mammals, especially us, that's what melanin does. Melanin stores that electronic energy. And what does it work with? It works with water, which is probably the second most amazing chemical. And it turns out that water is really important because when a baby is born and it has huge growth potential, we're made out of 80% water. When we get to be an old fucker like me, you're 55% water. So you lose your electrical potential. This idea, this fractal that we're discussing, it's there at every level. But the thing is, is I don't think people think about it the way, at least I think about it, maybe the way you think about it, because you're asking me really good questions. You know, I think people are going to like this podcast predominantly because you're asking provocative questions. You're asking questions that allow the onion skin to be pulled back and say, wow, I, you know, I never thought about it that way. And, and guess what? That's what has to happen in Becker's lab. Ling's lab, Lavoisier's lab, uh, Montagnier's lab, uh, in Levin's lab. We need more of that, not less of that. And when somebody comes up with a really good idea, uh, whether they have footnotes and they've cited the literature properly is immaterial. We need decentralized thinkers in science. That's what we really need. Uh, and I think when you actually get down to it, you know, like Turing and Claude Shannon, most of the ideas that they came up with on information theory, these were what we call de novo discussions. Like how did Turing figure out the Enigma code? How did, you know, Shannon solve for X with Bell Labs to make you know, sense of how messages are really handled so that he could get rid of all the spaghetti wires that are present. That that basic answer is, is going to be in the quantum mechanics of how nature works. Can you discover it, you know, through mathematics? Yeah, I think Feynman, if he was still alive, he would tell you that mathematics describes nature, but it doesn't explain it. And that's the reason why you cannot stay on uh, math. Math's not good enough. This is the reason why I think physics is stuck. Physics has been stuck since 1905. I think that's the reason Einstein was stuck. I don't think the answer between why quantum mechanics and relativity don't speak to each other is not a, It's not going to be a mathematical solution. Um, I think it's going to be something that's very unparsimonious that we don't understand yet. Um, and I wouldn't doubt that it has to do with the size or shape of different things, probably at the AMO level. Um, it wouldn't even surprise me if it turns out to be at the electric field and the magnetic field effect, because I think changing the electric field and changing the magnetic field has huge implications in biology. We already know that. Uh, I mean, Becker clearly showed that. Um, we know that when we change the magnetic flux, that's when we get all kinds of, of huge things. Go look at, at like ammonites in the sea and then look at magnetic hysteresis in the geology of the rocks. It's kind of amazing to me that you can actually see the magnetic footprint of what the Earth was in the past. And it's actually not only present in fossils, but it's also present in rocks. The thing that's interesting, rocks are not designed to change except with you know the physics of erosion. But biology does change. I mean, an ammonite has become us. I mean, that's a humongous change. So that tells you there's got to be a huge, huge range of electric and magnetic field effects that change biology. And, you know, to think that it's just, you know, the change in, say, um, ion channels, you know, I, I don't, I think that's way too simple. An answer. Do, do we know that it plays a huge role? Yeah. I mean, you know 
that calcium efflux plays a huge role in EMF. We know that it has a huge effect on how mitochondria work. There's no question that I believe that. But we also know that EMF also affects ROS. It affects RNS. It affects the pathways it goes. In. We even know that electrons on the inner mitochondrial membrane flow from cytochrome 1 to, uh, to oxygen. But you know what else we do know, Cameron, that we people still don't want to talk about? Electron flow can go backwards, can go the opposite way. And, and we know there's diseases out there that have no superoxide pulse at cytochrome 1. Um, and we also know that that change actually works in different environments better. We know that, you know, uh, wood frogs in Canada use that to actually freeze their own blood. They use high blood glucose to do it, you know. So, and why do you think, you know, people who have type 1 and type 2 diabetes tend to live in Scandinavia where it's cold? Is this a remnant effect that we even see in humans that's tied back to this evolutionary story? My belief is it is. Some things that we view as diseases today, I don't think are even diseases. In fact, you want to know the truth? I don't think cancer is a disease. I, th I actually think it's a it's a uh, a proof, a mathematical proof of what electromagnetic pollution is capable of. And I believe that because of what Becker found in his lab. Um, the, the most amazing thing that Becker found in his lab is when he was able to put a salamander asleep using a 2,000 Gauss magnet. I mean, fuck, he didn't do anything with that. That, to me, is one of the most amazing things that he's ever found. But what are we doing? We're still using big farmers' drugs to fucking put people to sleep every day when I do neurosurgery. Well, why isn't somebody studying the effects of magnetic flux on putting people to sleep. Because I'm going to tell you, based on what we talked about in this podcast, bro, that's all about magnetochemistry. In other words, when you can slow magnetochemistry down, that means you can slow time down. Again, we're back to that story about time controls the flow of energy and matter. That's really what Becker found when it comes to those high Gauss magnets. Uh, now, we're different than salamanders, but... We may need a, a 20 or 30,000 Gauss magnet to put us to sleep. But the fact that we could do that, and I think we should do that, I'd rather see us spend money on that than build a, a new CERN reactor in, in Europe. Um, those things have bigger impact on what we're doing in science, like the science to improve us. Uh, I'm not trying to take money away from the physicist. I'm just going to say that for the last 120 years, we spent a lot of money on physics and it's fucking gotten us nowhere, okay? Uh, we really, we really are, we haven't solved the big problems in physics yet. And there's more breakthroughs happening in quantum biology in the last 120 years than has happened in quantum mechanics. And it's about time we start putting our money and start studying the process that happened inside us, inside of cells, because I think we're going to learn a world about the low energy side of quantum mechanics. CERN deals with the high energy side. Nature is not interested in the high energy side. It appears to me based on what we studied. So how about we flip this around? It's my same argument that I use with, you know, people that focus on RNA and DNA. I said, We've been studying that since Watson and Crick's time. It's done nothing for us. Well, let's study mitochondrial DNA. How about we, we spend 99% for 50 years on mitochondrial DNA and only 1% on RNA? Because I personally think the RNA and DNA story, as I said with the genes, uh, genes only matter uh, based on what's going on with the electric potential of membranes that are in cells. That's really what the work of Levin is showing us. We've already known that. Nick Lane is adapted to that. We're there. We're, we're already there, but you know what? We need to go to that next level. We need to understand how that 30 million volt charge in the inner mitochondrial membrane is distributed over all the other membranes in eukaryotes. Like how does that power network really operate? That to me, is where you get to answer the question that you pose to me. What do you think about Levin and his ion channels? Well, I'm going to say, let's talk about the electric potential on membranes. And you're going to find out that that story is going to lead you to, you know, Michael Crawford and the work on DHA in membranes. Why is it that 
you know, mammals tend to use DHA in all their membranes and, you know, bacteria don't. You know, I tell people all the time, the only membrane in you that doesn't have DHA in it is the inner mitochondrial membrane because it's bacterial origin. It still works on the old shit, you know, manganese dioxide. Um, it's not working on the things that we work on. Well, and then when you consider that DHA hasn't been replaced one time since the Cambrian explosion, maybe maybe we should spend some money on that, you know, instead of building a new CERN reactor to go higher energy to figure out what's beyond, you know, the God particle. I want to ask you one last question before my head explodes. And this is about um, deuterium dynamics. So I've been very interested in understanding why um, or is having a higher DH ratio when living on the equator, does that serve a benefit? Or is it that when you're on the equator, there are other signals that are helping deplete the deuterium to hydrogen ratio so that no matter where you live on the world, uh, in the world, your deuterium to hydrogen ratio, it should be in a narrow range, or is there a benefit to having it a little bit higher when you have when you're at the equator? Yeah, I think this is a great question. I do believe that you need higher deuterium levels at the equator. The right. reason why is that offsets the electromagnetic radiation that you're getting from the sun because it's extremely strong there. Just remember the lesson from physics. Where do they use heavy water? They use it in nuclear reactors. Okay. Why do they use it in nuclear reactors? Because it turns out deuterium depleted, I should say deuterium enriched water helps control uh, chemistry that happens at high levels. It's exactly what life is telling you on earth as well. Um, the flip of that is since most humans on the planet have uncoupled haplotypes, that means they're not L0 through L3 that they have different metrics. So even when they migrate to the equator, do they need to do something different? Which is, you know, one of the mind boggling things that I always hear people like, oh, when I go to El Salvador, I need to go buy deuterium depleted water. And I'm like, why? Why don't you just drink coconut water? And, you know, and the thing is, I don't think people really, you know, when I say it to them, I think they're stunned because they always make the assumption that life should always use deuterium depleted water because that's what's good in cancer. Well, if you don't have cancer, you live at the equator, why would you make the assumption that deuterium depletion really matters? And really the answer is staring them right in the face. You know, if they look up Cherkov radiation, you know, in Chernobyl and things like that, you go, fuck, there's, there's a reason why nature uses deuterium. In fact, when you find out that when you have deuterium in the body and you put it under, say, a huge magnetic or electrical force, when you squeeze deuterium, the nucleus of it between the proton and the neutron, you actually create all spectrums of UV light. How about that? Could that be a reason why we use that? Might that be operational at nighttime in tropical environments? The answer is probably is. Maybe the reason why there's coconuts and pineapples there. You know, it's something something for people to begin to study. And hopefully these questions don't seem so foreign because, you know, when you have a guy like Boros out there or a Gabor Somali, and they're only giving you a, a very myopic opinion of what's going on with deuterium because that's how I feel about both of them. I think Gabor's wiser about deuterium depletion and cancer I think Boros is completely off his rocker on some of this stuff where he thinks, you know, it's a it's a beneficial effect to always do to deplete to turn. I think the only reason he really believes that is because he suffers from his own form of cancer that he got, but he never thought about maybe living in Los Angeles at UCLA is a problem. You know, in fact, it may turn out that he needed more deuterium to avoid the prostate cancer than he thought. But see, that never thinks because guess what happens? When you have the idea in your head that deuterium depletion is the only way to go because your friend is a cancer doctor in Hungary, that's what he's found at a higher latitude, you're equivocating two different things that you probably shouldn't equivocate. As a scientist, especially a decentralized scientist, you need to parse out 
you know, what happens in physics and what happens in biology and then figure out what is life really doing? Is, is there something here that I'm missing? And in my opinion, um, he's missing a lot. Um, I think Gabor is really doing yeoman's work for people with cancer, because I do believe that people that have mitochondrial diseases, which are timing diseases, because remember, I told you, mitochondria are functionally time machines. Uh, I believe cancer is a time disease. Um, I think maybe 50 years from now, people will listen to this podcast and go the same way Becker did when he heard, you know, Albert St. Georgie, that I think these are the questions that need to be answered. We need water researchers to do better job studying, you know, high deuterium water in cells around DNA uh, in the circulatory system. How does it affect, you know, the dielectric constant? How does it affect biophoton release? How does it affect the ROS signal? Uh, to be honest with you, these are questions I want to know too. Yeah. Why? I think I've got to the level that I can get to because I don't have these tools in my bag to check it when I'm doing brain surgery. But if you don't think when I'm doing brain surgery that I'm not thinking about some of these things that we're talking about right now, you're fucking crazy. I actually told you guys that in the Ruben podcast. Every time I open up someone's head, and I shine, you know, my xenon bulb on their brain. I'm going, what fucking thing am I blowing up in their head now by doing this just so I can see what I'm doing? I realize that that's a problem. It's the same way I look at, you know, breast cancer. Why does it make any sense to anybody that we use mammography machines? We're using x-ray to, to go for cancer. To me, that is like mind boggling that we do it. Um I think those are the questions that that need to be asked, answered, and studied. Uh, hopefully, somebody you know listens to this podcast and goes, "Yeah, this is this is agent provocateur talking again." Um, I think we're at a standstill in biology and physics, and I think our curiosity is going to push us forward. Well, we've come full circle and you've given me enough to keep me busy for the next few years. I think I'm going to have to really dig into all of this and um, hopefully come back and um, and dig even deeper with you uh, in the future because this is just, I've had my mind blown uh, even more than I did in our last conversation. Thank you so much for giving me some of your time. Hey, no problem. Take care. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you want to know more about Jack and his work, I encourage you to search for other podcasts and videos with him as he's extremely generous with his time and he's done hundreds of episodes. He also has a very interesting Patreon where he writes blog posts regularly with really fascinating information. If you'd like to keep up to date with my work, please feel free to subscribe to the podcast. It really helps me grow the channel and get more incredible guests to speak with. Sometimes it can be a struggle to get guests to come on because of the relatively small viewership. So it makes a really big difference if we can grow the channel together. I also have a Substack that I'm really excited about because I'm using it to go even deeper into these podcast topics while also offering my thoughts and ideas. This is really the best way to keep on track with my work while also supporting the podcast. I've also left links below where you can follow me on social media and keep in touch with me in general. So thanks again for listening, everyone. Take care.